All right, welcome everybody to our uh, January meeting this nice crisp summer day. Um, the uh, let's see, we got we hit record to it, so we got everything going there. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here. Um, any new members? We have Dave Root. Have you got a you got your name tag? How'd you get that? Have you been to a meeting? Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, so Dave uh, Dave over here is a new member which is good. We didn't have enough Daves. So <laughs> now that helps. No, no, no. All Dave all night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of little puns there. So welcome. Do we have any other new members that want to say, Hey, I'm new. I'm here for the first time or no. Okay. Um, um, right now our current membership, our dues for 2024 are $35. And uh, we have a new membership person. He's standing in the back there, Gary. Wave your hand. So if you're interested in becoming a member, stop and see Gary on the break, and uh, he'll happily take your $35. Um, uh, some of the benefits of being a member is uh, we have a library out back that you can check out books and DVDs from. It's in the room that you pass on the way here. Um, we also have sharpening stations there. I, th well, I think we only have one here. The other one's, I think, still at Ron's. Yeah, but we have a sharpening station here. If you have tools you need sharpen, you're welcome to use that and sharpen up. Um, we have uh, mentorship available. If you uh, you know want to get some one-on-one -on -one coaching with uh, somebody, you know you're working on something you don't quite know what to do, or you have questions about things, you know we we have mentors um, kind of spread around the area. If you look at our newsletter, they're all listed with I think email addresses. Um, you know, I'm one of them, you know, I'm happy to have someone come out to my shop for a couple hours and bring whatever they're working on. And, and, uh, I can give them my two cents worth and put it on my lathe and break it for them, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll show you how not to do it. <laughs> what happens when you do it wrong? I'm not afraid to break your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, we have that. Um, this past month I had, uh, we put out an invite. Everybody want to come out to see, uh, the one-way coring system that I have, and I cored a large burl, and I had 15 guys show up, almost as many people as in this room. <laughs> so that was a pretty good uh, afternoon, and uh, uh, we, we cored, a, cored a great big burl. I think I got five bowls out of it. It was after lunch, so yeah. Yeah, there was no, no serving going on. I, I had one chair for somebody to sit down in if they had to take a break, so... <laughs> Um, so anyways, yeah, so if you uh, need help with something, you know, it's not, you don't have to be a beginner that's, you know, that requests mentorship. You can be a seasoned turner, you know, I have some guys that come out that just want to get my idea on something, you know, and run something past me and get my thoughts on it. So, so anyways, get a hold of us. We're always happy to have someone out, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not an inconvenience. We, you know, I know Ron would say the same thing. We enjoy having someone come out to our shop and, uh, you know, hang out for a couple hours. You know, even if it's just some people just want to come and watch me, watch what I'm doing. No, I'm, I'm fine with that. You can stand there and watch me do whatever I do and see how I do things. So um, we uh, let's see, moving down here. We, we did have election of officers. I should have said that first. And we have new positions. And that's why I'm up here now. Um, I'm back in the president's seat for one year. <laughs> Dave's really happy about that. <laughs> he finally came back to a meeting. Now that now, now that we have a different president, <laughs> um, so and so I we just kind of swap positions. He's vice president now. I'm president. Um, Gary is our new um, membership person. Um, we want to give a big hand to Steve Payne for the years he spent doing that. He did a great job. Uh, we really appreciate that. And the same thing for Joe Spryce. He, he just retired too. And he's been on the board for four or five years working on demonstrations. So we, we, we had a little bit of a, of a turnover and uh, it's good. We got some fresh blood now and uh, we're moving forward. We, uh, we've got a pretty good year of uh, demonstrators lined up. Um, so uh, uh, I think, the, let's see, this month we're doing photography Next month is a bull from a board. Um, Pete's going to do it. Pete Vandermeer. He's got an example on show and tell table, I think. Um, the, in March, we're going to have uh, Jeff Heidela is going to do a natural edge bull. I don't see Jeff here today, but he's going to do a natural edge bull. 
And then April, we have Tom Hale. And I don't know, we don't know what he's going to do yet. He's going to do something. We'll, we'll announce it when we figure it out. <laughs> Hopefully by February or, we'll, or by March, we'll know what he's going to be doing in April. So um, uh, Tom Hale in April. Yeah, he's out of Ohio. Yeah, he's been at Ron's retreat every year, right? He's always there. So, so that's that's coming up the next three months. Um, so we're looking forward to some nice demonstrations. We got some professionals coming in later in the summer, um, early fall. Um, so, if 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 you do have an idea of something you'd like to see on our demonstration, um, let one of us know. You know, because we right now we're we just kind of flying blind. I thought some. I know we've done uh, surveys in the past. Um, I, I know John Singleton did a survey a few years ago to find out what people want. We probably should be doing that again to find out what people want to see up here. Um, but uh, right, we tried to we tried to change it up and keep it fresh. Yes, Gary. In taking over the membership duties, one of them is sending out the newsletter. The newsletter goes to 184 people. And since I'm a new person sending it to you, some of the computers pick that up. That's junk mail. So that did all of you receive the revised January 2024 newsletter? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody could have got it twice. Yeah, that. Yeah, so if you. If you didn't receive it, let me know and I'll check to make sure your email address is in our system. But then also for those that don't think they got it, check your junk mail. Yes, uh, my wife and I share the same email. That way I have an automatic secretary. Her name is Cynthia, so that it's coming from Cynthia Humphreys rather than Gary Humphreys. Yeah, so it's coming from Cynthia Humphreys. That way, when we get emails and things, it shows up on her phone and she can tell me, Gary, you got an email. And I, I don't have to uh, keep track of all that. So uh, trying to do a good job, but with the transition, there are always some little uh, flies in the ointment. When this phone was found, the email was the worst thing we had. <laughs> Yeah, it he has a slick, slick. I had to buy a brand new computer because my <laughs> my outdated one wouldn't process what he had. So uh, hats off to him, and I want to try to continue a good job. So if you didn't get the newsletter, please let me know so I can figure out why. Thank you. Yeah, and if you find it in your in your junk folder or your spam folder, um, click on it that it's not spam, and then put. Cynthia Humphrey's name in your address book. Save it, save her name in your contacts. Because then if her, if her name's in your contacts, your computer should recognize that and say, oh, this is a known person. It's not junk. So that, that'll help so you get all the emails. But yeah, they, I know they sent out a few trying to get things right. Um, I know we talked about sending out another test one, but uh, maybe, maybe we'll just wait and see how many people find it in their spam folder. So. Okay, so let's see. Uh, moving on down the list, I think. Um, do we want to do a treasurer's report? I can just say our, our balance is thirteen thousand eight hundred ninety-one dollars and sixty-seven cents. If you have any questions about that, Pete's in the front row here. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. I uh, I went and found my my paper here on my computer that I the last one I did was last. January, I still had it on my computer, and our balance last January was like thirteen thousand one hundred. So we've increased eight hundred dollars in the last year. At least we're not going backwards, <laughs> and that included some uh, you know, professional turners and you know, like uh, Nick. That cost us money to bring him in. So we, I thought that was pretty good that we uh, had professional turners. We 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 spent money on, that we normally wouldn't have done on professional turners, and we still, you know, gained eight hundred dollars over the course of the year. So. I thought that was good. Um, 
do we have anything else? Oh, I have this here. Um, this is something that some of the other clubs have been doing um, with uh, show and tell. And I think we're going to try this. We're going to put this on the show and tell table starting next month. If you bring in show and tell, we would like you to write down your name. Okay, don't get maker. We have maker and name. Okay. Name the name of the piece, if it's got a name. Okay. We're going to have something like this down there that you put your name on, put what kind of wood it is, what the finish is on it, and we're going to try and do a better job of uh, of getting pictures of our show and tell and putting them online on our Facebook page so that people can see what we're all doing. Um, <clears throat> Today, our, our demonstration is photography. So we are going to probably try and take a picture of everything. As you guys do show and tell, we're going to set on the table, snap a picture of it, and then we'll show um, for our demonstration how how me and Ron do it. Ron uses a cell phone to do it. I use uh, just old school uh, a snap photog uh, camera. So we're going to show two different methods on how to uh, uh, take pictures of your work. So you can, uh, you know, apply for shows and stuff. Because right now, this is the time of year to do it. Because most of those shows, um, applications are due January and February for the whole year, you know. So that's why we thought we'd do that this month on photography. So if we don't have anything else, I think we're going to start with show and tell then. Um, and what you Hey, Doug? Yes. What about Art Fest? Art Fest? The Festival of the Arts, regional yeah, arts. Yeah, you know where we always put up. No, where we always put up the tent. Um, I don't think we're doing that this year. I don't know. Okay. The club is not correct. Yeah, the club is not doing it. So, um, you, it's it's everybody's kind of on their own with that, I believe. So we're okay. we're not getting involved with that. Um, if we're not doing it, can I use the tent? Um, I, I think the tent's already been called for. I think I think the tent's going to get used. Um, we have an extra tent. We have a 10 by 10 and a 10 by 20. Um, so I think we have a 10 by 10 that's available. I, I think all those tents are still at your, your shop, right? The 10 by 10's here? Okay. 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 All right, so if you talk to Ron, he's got a 10 by 20 you can borrow. Okay. Um, okay, so let me get these on, turned on here so we can. Uh... We'll snap pictures, and then uh, after the break, we'll uh, go through and. Uh, and. Uh, edit them. And post them online. So mm -hmm. let me uh and uh let's line up for show and tell. Um and uh yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary I'm gonna go first. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gary Humphreys. Jeff Brill is my mentor, if though he probably wouldn't want to claim me. I'm an experimenter. I, I'm a relatively new turner. These two bowls are halves of the same green cherry log. And I previously at Show and Tell commented about just uh, the difference between having a rim that was incidental, you're turning the bowl and well, I'm finishing it versus intentional, planning the rim ahead of time. And so, these are experimental. I have two different planned intentional rims on them. And to me, they do change the personality of the bowl that uh, I've been having fun drawing out different types of rims for them. And then number two, I use two different finishes. Again, these are the same piece of wood, just mirror images. This one is a polyurethane finish. And this one is a hemp oil finish. Hmm. And just, I see a difference in how it uh, affected the color and grain. And they both have a really nice feel to them. What kind of wood is this? 
Uh, this is Cherry. Yeah. And uh, hemp oil. Got it out at Woodcraft. Uh, uh, this one is also from the same tree, just uh, one section down. And that one's with hemp oil also. That when I bought it, uh, I think it was Ken Blaine who said, oh, he doesn't like fooling around with the polyurethane because uh, this is white bond polyurethane. It takes all of about five minutes or less to put a layer on, but this has about five layers of urethane on it. Whereas, oh, you can just put the hemp oil on once and you're done with it. Read the label. It says it takes 24 hours for the partial cure, but it takes a month to six weeks to fully cure as the uh, oil hardens and makes the layer. So that uh, those are all cherry. And then I had a, a pile of these old oversized test tubes at home. We got new neighbors, a nice young gal who likes uh, gardening and she had a couple raised gardens. And every morning she was out clipping some flowers and putting them in a vase and she came over and gave me some, and so I had the brainstorm. The, we like to have nice, easy, little uh, um, projects to do. Hey, I'll make a nice, heavy enough base to hold it. And this is just the bud vase. And it took me about less than 10 minutes to make the bases. This one's a nice curly maple. It uh, showcases the wood, and this one is red cedar. But one's for my neighbor and one's for my wife. Uh, but most of us have little pieces of wood around the shop. And hey, that's sort of quick, easy, and fun. So. Got pictures of two of them, so OK. Um, if we can move them out, OK. Hi, I'm Carl Hansen from Grand Haven, a relative new member of Grand Valley, formerly with the Michigan, Asso Michigan Association of Wood Turners, which is on the Sunrise side. Uh, I like to use wood that has a connection. This piece of uh, five-quarter walnut crotch uh, I harvested from a friend's house at about uh, about a dozen years ago. Took it to a mill, mill, a mill shop, and had them because I couldn't really do anything on the lathe to flatten this out or anything. So I took it to a mill shop like here, and they sanded it down, and then I finished sand it, and I just had this hunk of wood just laying around for years and years, knowing that I was going to turn it into something. And um, about two and a half years ago, we had a a sugar maple tree in our backyard fall. So I harvested the trunk of that sugar maple and uh, uh, turned this last week and then put this together Thursday, put a finish on it yesterday to bring it here today. So, so now we have a side table uh, from our backyard and from a, a, from a friend's yard of very nice piece of walnut crotch. Yeah. And uh, I'll be going to church tomorrow to ask forgiveness for doing some flat boarding. <laughs> oh, carefully, none of the legs are identical, but they do share uh, transition dimensions, widths, diameters, uh, where the tops are, the diameters of the bottoms. So I don't try to make them identical. That's way too much work. <laughs> uh, so, but they have 
common elements which Gibson has a design wise a whole that you can see they're approximately at the same spots and diameters are the same in place. So there's elements of common design, but then three legs are unique. So I don't have to kind of turn. Yeah. What's the finish? Um, the, the base was um, shellac, shellac, um, diluted shellac. And then the polyurethane on both. I thought about using uh, uh, wood oil and tongue oil. I just want to make it up. Ten degrees. Ten degrees. Uh, I've got a pedestal drill press and it's only a 13 inch, so I wasn't able to like put, put these in. So I had to make some 10 degree wedges, put it on a piece of plywood, attach that to a large uh, table on the pedestal drill press, and then attach this the C plant bees to to that, and that's where I got the ten degrees. So yeah, you have to do it right. Yeah. Yeah, this is just medium size. Uh, this is a piece of spalted maple that I was supposed to help a friend clean up the log pile from four or five years ago. We finally cut it up mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. And I hauled a bunch of it home. It's a little further gone than it should have been, but. Uh, this is what I got out of the first piece. Uh, it's kind of an image, which I, I've got, I don't know if it's an old Calvin College thing or what, but an art professor is talking about image all the time. I'm not sure what it means. It just came out and I can't figure out why on earth I'd carve oak leaves into a piece of maple, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after uh, I did a, a lot of the carving, some of it was done by hand, uh, the detailed stuff. The rest of it is a combination of hand tools and saber tooth, mostly with a cutter head about that big and hang on and hold the piece of wood down so it doesn't fly away. A lot of sanding, a little bit of texture work here and there with smaller cutters. And uh, then I did an epoxy seal on it. Some of the wood was pretty unstable in front of an exhaust fan with a respirator and lots of fresh air comes through a window right behind me. And then it's a uh, pre-cat pile, or I'm sorry, pre-cat lacquer on top of it. That's nice. it. <laughs> So I'm Chris. Uh, yeah, I'm I, talking to you. Okay. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I've been turn. I've been here a couple months now. This is the first time sharing. So, uh, spent the last three days in the shop. Sub zero weather. Uh, turning pens. So these are two of the twenty five that I turned in the last three days. So I'm kind of proud of myself for actually getting all twenty five mostly done. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, these are the new hobby knife kits from. Uh, Penn State uh, and uh, uses the uh, aluminum hex blanks uh, from wood turnings. 
Uh, the maker space where I'm at has heat. It gets up to a nice balmy 50. Um, my barn on the other hand does not. So, uh, we were in the shop downtown this most of this week, uh, cause it's, it's too cold. It's <laughs> zero. So where's the maker space at? Uh, Kalamazoo. Um, we're right down off main street. So once you go under the bridge, uh, past where Arcadia Brewery is, we're the first building on the right. Um, so they've got a full wood shop. Uh, metal shop and then a couple of cool lasers that we can play with um, so I've been trying to incorporate more of the lasering and um, metal working into my designs um, slowly but surely getting there yeah so it's a collective of makers so it's basically it's 45 bucks a month um, you get access to all their setups um, so once you've had the training on the tools they basically let you use it whenever the hours or availability are open um, which is nice because they've got a planer and a joiner that are the nice 20 inchers. And so I can actually plane material and clear material and stuff I can't do on the home shop. So you do flat work? I do flat. I do a little bit of everything, metalworking, woodworking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Selective hearing. I must have missed that part. <laughs> so what kind of blanks are these? Some kind of honeycomb? Yeah. So it's a aluminum honeycomb. Okay. Um, so it's actually, I think, a furnace filter that then they pour epoxy in. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, and so they're actually fun to turn because you have to use sandpaper to knock the edges off. Um, because if you try and turn it, it'll hit the little cubes and basically pop the whole thing out of the aluminum. Um, so you basically use sandpaper to get it mostly round, then a negative rate cutter to actually turn it. Um, Hmm. Otherwise, you ha you'll you'll start popping them apart. And uh, I showed Dad how to do it, and we had two of them blow up on the lathe the first time we did it. So, yeah. So they just they just they like to just come apart and in pieces, and they fly everywhere. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Okay. Cool. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily. Um, this is my third time bringing something, but my first time being brave enough to show it in front of you cool people. Um, I made a, a pepper grinder. Um, I made it out of a bubinga blank that I got from Woodcraft. Um, my favorite part of this project was using the Forstner bit to hollow out the middle. Um, and my least favorite part was trying to finish it. So I, I'm still trying to work on what kind of finishing to use and making it look smooth. So what finish did you have on it? Uh, shellac, and then it looked too glossy. So I uh, sanded it off almost all the way and then uh, ax polishing paste, but it did, it, yeah. I think at that point I just kind of gave up and said, it is what it is. <laughs> Thanks. Nice. One? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look at all the different wood he got yeah. out of that one. Yeah. <laughs> <That's incredible. laughs> yeah, these are just some some uh, stuff that's been laying around on the floor, and I've been tripping over for about two years. So I decided to finish them out. And the big one here is folded maple, a uh, piece of walnut. That's oak. These two are cherry. And this one here, I was surprised because it uh, <clears throat> had a lot of stress in it. it even if, you know, as dead dry and being spalded, you wouldn't think it would. And after it was all turned, sanded and everything, it was just sitting there. And all at once I, was, I heard a big bang. It sounded like somebody shot a gun. <laughs> and uh, it, it cracked. Uh, let's see, right about here. You can see it better on the inside than you can on the outside. Uh, and I don't know why. It might eventually just destroy itself. So It was two years old. It was, it, it was older than that, actually. 
And uh, I don't, I wouldn't think Spalding Maple would have any stress in it, but it, but it did. <laughs> and I, any of huh? Any of oh yeah, yeah. I had to put some wood hardener on it to uh, to get it smoothed out. And I like to use a product called PC Petrifier for the wood hardener. Uh, it's it's kind of a water base. It'll take a little longer to dry, uh, but not much than uh, some of the others. <clears throat> but it's a lot easier to sand. It doesn't clog your sandpaper all up like some of the others. This one here was a piece of oak that was laying around there. It had a big crack in it. And if you look close, you can see it just a little bit here on the outside. I got most of it turned out. And that was one that uh, somebody else had cored out, got roughed out. And it was, it was, it is what it is. Don't crack, don't go through. But <clears throat> the it was already glued when I got it. <clears throat> if they hadn't put the glue in, it would have been you'd have been uh, able to uh, bring that back in. And the way you do that is is take and mix <clears throat> white glue up with water, thin it way out, probably about fifty percent, and put that in there and keep it wet. Just just soak it and that'll close that up. And after it dries, it, most of the time it'll stay right together. And it, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do anything to that one. I just left it. <laughs> so it didn't go all the way up to the rim and it didn't uh, go down to the bottom. So I just left it. And another thing I do when I when these are green is I I use some uh, anchor seal and I, I cover up all the in grain both inside and out. I leave the side grain open. <clears throat> and what that does is it forces the the moisture to go out the side grain as opposed to going out the in grain. And that's usually what cracks it is. Uh, the side, the in grain loses the water so much quicker than the side grain does. And I've had real good luck doing that. Just get kind of a triangle pattern, just kind of comes up in here to the center. You don't have to be real neat about it or anything. But just just force it to go out the side grain and then, and then you'll end up. This one's a wallet one. And that one turned out a whole lot better than I thought it was. Good. <laughs> kind of a pretty grain in it. And these two are just kind of flat grain cherry. So you're welcome to pick any of these up and look at them. Do anything you want to with them when they're, when they're over there. Hi, I'm Jim. Um, I make almost all segmented bowls. I get all kinds of scrap wood from a couple of different cabinet shops, and it's cheap and it's easy to make. And when you screw up, it's easy to cut it off and glue some more stuff to it. This one I was making, I actually cut it in half, set it on the workbench, let it sit for a couple of months. Finally glued it back together and got it turned, took it in, sprayed it, went to take it home and dropped it and broke the base off. So I take it back, glue it back together again. But sooner or later they get finished. <laughs> and there they are. <laughs> this is mahogany. And uh, this is the edge banding that I bought here. They had some for sale couple weeks, you know, last time, and I bought those and glued them together and made stripes out of them, and 
So you can pretty much use anything you can find to scrap wood making segments. So, and segments is easy. You need a little plywood base or a MDF base with two fences on it and some wedges and you can make your own sizes and all that kind of stuff. I actually have a seg easy plate that's got dividers between them and you can get a plate for different numbers of sec sections. And then just depending on how wide they are is how big your things get. Put them in there, put a rubber band on them, glue them, and then on the lathe, just line them up and hold them on there for a couple minutes. And I just started using thick and thick and quick, which is a tight bond. Mm -hmm. That dries clear and you can put a ring on, let it sit for three, four minutes and take it apart. I usually then set down the bench and put a 10 pound weight on it while making more rings and stuff. But you can do it a lot faster than tight bond where you stick it on and have to let it sit for 20 or 30 minutes before you dare take it apart. So there we go. <laughs> I'm Bruce. Bruce, yeah, there you go. Um, I don't know if these are out of the same log or not, but they're both cherry. Uh, I had rough turned this one and then went back and finished it up, so it's it's nice and dry. This has uh, wipe on poly on it, a couple coats, three, five coats maybe. Um, this one. Uh, has a handy uh, tenon on the bottom. It's a little bit wiggly, but it's good for when you want to refinish the bowl, you can just put it right back on the lathe. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of wood was this? Cherry. And they're both cherry. I think they're just out of two different trees. But anyway, it's just I'm just playing with form a little bit. Uh, there's a slight sort of dovetail shape to the base. And kind of a nice feel around the edge where you can put your fingers to hold the bowl. So that's it. Yeah. Sure. Dave Gurley, um, you know, everybody knows I do pine needle basketry in, in my pieces. Uh, these two pieces uh, I turned after Rudy, uh, Rudy Lopez came to town and, and showed us some, you know, some things about uh, turning, you know, uh, natural edge. And so I, I had turned a bunch of them, you know, just a, went out and got a bunch of crotch pieces, turned a bunch, just threw them on the shelf and let them sit there until, you know, at some point in time, two, two things come together and you make it, you know, something different. So uh, these two pieces, um, they're probably, uh, uh, the wood is probably either locust, like a very young locust or, um, uh, mulberry because we had a power power lines you know power company came in and took stuff down very much like they did this week and mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and so i just had a bunch of that kind of stuff laying around so those two are um go ahead um this one was very similar i i turned this piece of oak probably six years ago and didn't really do a very good job on the inside you know, because I was kind of learning, but I really love the outside. So I'm not throwing this away, you know, so over time, you know, there were some cracks that developed and filled those in, kind of smoothed those out, um, but took this to a level of, you know, putting the pine needles on. I showed that on Facebook, I wasn't selling it. I wasn't trying to sell it because I was doing this for gallery stuff later on, but within a half an hour, 
you know, someone approached me and said, is that for sale? Well, yeah, it's for sale. You know, it's going to be. Um, so it's already sold. I asked her, you know, before I ship it, I want to bring it here, you know, kind of thing. Um, how much? Um, well, it's it would have been different if I was going to put it in the gallery by the amount of the um, commission. So um, this piece, and, and it was kind of somebody that I know as well, so I so I was like, you know, let's go, let's go 125, you know, plus shipping, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so that's how much I, I probably would have gone more in the gallery, um, you know, but it was like, I was kind of honored that that person um, asked me, you know, to, to buy it from me because I know she collects a lot of uh, pretty renowned people's work. You know, if you look on her shelf, she's got John Jordan, she's got um, Derek Weidman, you know, probably some of yours, yeah. you know, you know, so, so I was kind of honored. Yeah, she probably did, but, you know, but, but to me, you know, it's like, like she has a life or a, not a lifestyle, but a cost of living in, you know, California. I don't have that cost of living here. So, so I can, I can, I love, you know, I could, I could deal with that. So this piece actually right here, and I want to get this, maybe I should just leave it there. Yeah. So, but I do want to show the edge. So, um, so this was actually done piece of Madrone wet. I got it a year and a half or two years ago, three years ago. And it's been sitting in water ever since Changed out the water every once in a while because it came to you wet. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I turned the rim by doing multiple axes to get the rim kind of, kind of, um, flat. And because this was this was curved, basically this way, so Madrone moves a lot. You know the this diameter, you know, distorted quite a bit. Um, that is the only place I sanded, and I sanded that to about three twenty. And you can kind of feel this; it's all bumpy. You know, it's all distorted, and I, that really gets my juices flowing. This kind of stuff right here. So, um, I I used uh, shellac like a sander seal or 50-50 shellac. Uh, and that's the only finish that I've got on here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say that doing the multiple axes, I intentionally left tool marks in here this this deep because I knew they would you know, be feature when it was done. But if you follow them, you can actually see where they come off and start back up again, that type of thing. So this this to me is the coolest thing I've ever done so far, you know, so. Well, it's just it just when it's cut down, it stays wet, right? So it's in water. Um, I keep it in water until I turn it. So it, when I'm turning it, it's spraying me in the face. Um, no, to keep it to keep it in a stable stable position. When you turn it, it's going to move, and, um, and when it dries, so a microwave is also involved with this. Um, so, so I know it's going to move this, this wood doesn't really crack much, but it does move, you know, so that's, that's what I like, you know, that kind of thing. So, and you said fig wood is another wood that fig. probably it's something. Okay. The fine, the good piece of fig is almost impossible. Yeah. And it, I think this spring, I'm going to order another girl. So if you're interested, see me in the spring. Uh, I don't know how big a one I'll bring in. Usually they're around 300 to 400 pounds. It's the most fascinating wood I've ever turned. Dave's is exceptionally dark because he kept it wet for three years on that. I also used Madrone juice. Oh, you did? As a stain. So you can see that, you can see this edge right here. Uh, this is the only place where I didn't stain it. So you see that there's a color difference between here and there. So oh. some of you who don't know, we took all the cutoff and scrap of the drone, the small pieces, okay? And we're talking pieces like this. Put them in a kettle, boil it, and then all the color starts to come out. So then when you go back, you've turned your piece, and it starts to warp up. You pop it in the microwave for 10 seconds. And then after it's pretty much dry and done moving, you take a brush and you put the Madrone juice on it. That's what give it that dark color. Mine are not quite that dark because I didn't use Madrone juice. 
And I've got another one I'll show you in one of the demos. Some of you that have been to the retreat like our pickles. If you dip a piece of oak in that pickle juice, it's black. <laughs> It only grows from Northern California to Vancouver. It is guarded by both federal governments. You have to have a permit to harvest it. So when it's shipped, usually I get a permit signage on the borough to tell me it was properly harvested. Because you don't want to get caught with the one that's not. A 10, see, let me get this right, 10 by 10 by 12 block with a natural edge like he had, is gonna weigh in between 50 and 60 pounds. It's 60 to 70% water. And I'm gonna tell you, that's not cheap to ship. Yeah. That, it's one of the most expensive woods I've worked with, and I'm trying to get some, this one guy to send me a piece of fig from Israel. I can do anything to turn it. I'm Pete Vandermeer, I'm uh, one of the turners. I got challenged by my brother-in-law about oh, 15 years ago to see what I could do with a piece of plywood um, that was 12 by 36. And that sort of became my standard of figuring out various options. This one is a ring from a bowl. And that's what my demo next month is going to be on. Um, a bowl from a board. Rather. A bowl from a board, yeah. Yeah, but anyhow, it's, it, it's it's ring bowl, it's it's ring turning and re gluing. It's uh, an incredibly easy way of doing something that is somewhat segmented. Um, some people are amazingly good at segmenting and gluing. I uh, found that really tiring, but this only requires about six glues, which is a lot easier. And it's just an interesting pattern. And you can do it in a lot of different types of wood besides plywood. Um, it's just a, I guess, a technique that I think is fun to learn and to play with. So that's my demo for next month. Come back next month. He'll show you. Yeah. Next month, we're going to show you how to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, when I when I had everybody over a couple weeks ago that pour the burl, this was the 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 big piece I got from it that day. Um, I, this has just got my sanding sealer on it. I haven't had a chance to get back and actually finish it. I think I'm going to finish it with a uh, hard wax oil which I've used on a couple other bowls and I really like it. I got the idea from Bruce Dannenhauer. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's easy to put on and it makes a really nice finish. So uh, maybe next month I'll have it all finished and I'll bring it back in. So um, now we're going to head online. So if you're online and you've got show and tell, raise your hand. Um, you can click on your reactions button at the bottom and, Oh, we got one more. I'm sorry. Ron, hang on. Okay. We got one more. And then, uh, then we'll go online. These are all oak. Uh, they have been turned thin and they have been sandblasted. Uh, I came across these two old lamps. Uh, neither one was shades. Uh, you know, it might be kind of interesting to make a shade. And we have one hanging from a pendant above our uh, island. And I have two more lamps. I have one more lampshade done. I've got one more lampshade that's going to be a fire starter. And <laughs> if you look at the difference in these two pieces of oak, this one's three years old. It's been sitting outside my shop. It's, it's still usable, but this area is not extremely strong. This was cut in November. Our daughter had to take down a giant white oak. 10 foot around at the base uh, they couldn't take it out from the backyard so what they had to do is bring a crane out and start taking it over the two story house so there was a ton of white oak it was $18,000 to have that tree brought down 
and I <laughs> wanted disc. These are all turned from disc, okay? And I just couldn't handle any. And then all of a sudden, inside the tree, it was totally dead and hollow. That's why they had to take it down. I could walk up and pull bark off of it at the base. So if you look at this here, pure white. Now, I did not bleach this piece. My next one will be bleached. And it's. I think it's prettier. I have one more piece in the blasting cabinet that has the bark on it. I've never looked at saving the bark. I don't find the bark terribly attractive on oak. This is a tube, and I'm having fun making these because they move all over the place. And you can see, as fragile as it looks, and as thin as it is, it's pretty strong, okay? Now, at a show, I did have a piece fall on the floor. Again, it's fire starter. Well, these, are, these are fun. I probably have four hours of breakfast. sandblasting on this piece. I, think it's I may have a an hour and a half in turning to get it that thin. You're always sliding your calipers down. I set my calipers to be somewhere around two millimeters. Questions? Comments? Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, what am I going on? Now, part of the problem you have is trying to keep that two millimeter thickness. I should have brought another piece in. It's easy to make the slightest move, and now you're at less than a millimeter. And then when you go to sandblast it, that's the first place it goes through. Uh, this has just been fun. That's an LED bulb in there. Uh, I don't think you can see it. It's pretty long. It's 800 watts. And it doesn't put out any heat. You don't want to put a regular bulb in there where you're going to get too much heat. So when I first did this, I get it all done and take it in the house. I'm happy as hell, right? So I mount it up. Let's see how it fits up. Fits fine. I leave the light on for a couple hours. So I don't have any finish on it. So I thought, oh, I'm going to take it off and I'm going to finish it. Wouldn't come off. <laughs> this is thick up here and it moved and it cinched down over the inch and a half socket. Now I'm trying to hold this piece without crushing it and getting it off. I was fortunate enough, I was able to do it and it's, it's fun. Uh, I photographed both pieces just like this. Love turning the stuff, gets me away from my birds a little. Very nice. Hey, Ron, you, did you mean eight watts? Yeah, yeah, you didn't need 800 watts, did you? Question online, what was that, Dave? He said 800 watts. You mean probably eight watts, the lamp. Lumens, yes. I'm sorry. Good correction, Dave. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, George. Why would I want to do that? I want to take wood away. I can tell you, uh, I'm using glass boots, crushed, I'm sorry, crushed glass. Okay, with crushed glass, you get a lot of powder and stuff coming off. If you put a drop of CA glue in there to stop the crack, you ain't gonna blast it out. I, I, I would think glass would be harder than CA glue. Mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. Yeah, what am I hardening? The medullary lines or the soft growth rings? Uh, I it was still, I'm still able to turn it. So I don't want to treat that wood with anything. When it comes off the lathe, this took 
probably 75 minutes to turn, maybe two hours. It goes directly from the lathe into the blasting cabinet while it's wet. And then I'll, I'll come back the next day and spend half the day sandblasting, okay? Any other questions? Okay. Very good. Okay, now I think we can go online, Dave. Okay, Mark Wallace, if you're ready, um, I'll spotlight you and go ahead. Tell us about your piece. All right, I've been I've been playing with. Uh, last summer, I went to the Ohio Valley Wood Wood Turning Turners Symposium, and Robert Hendrickson did you know did this. So I'm I'm trying it. Um, you start out by drilling holes on the back and then you use a face plate and you put in a plug and then you well you get it so that it slips in the hole and you have your your live center coming up holding it and you do your um, your rings. So I did the three, and in here I did uh, I did six, and I painted the I spray painted well I spray dyed one side red and the other side blue. So you can you know if you're in person you can see you're looking at the edges and you get different color color effects. Then, then I turned away the portion where in the center where the center points were, and then I used and you know, created some beads and sprayed those with my airbrush. Then I was trying, I tried to make a wreath, and so this is the same as this except i turned away the center and turned the uh turned the sides out to make it to make it round and then instead of using you know an air gun with uh, sprays i used a torch to uh highlight it so that's what i've been playing with in the last month or so very nice, thanks. Ruby, can you go ahead? We'll um, show your thing next. Okay. All right, one thing I did do was um, play around with a couple of new kits that were available from William Woodwright, and they're salt and pepper shakers. And I, for the wood, I just used some small pieces of burl that I had. And they're, they work quite effectively. You just unscrew the top uh, for putting your, your salt and pepper in. And they're, they're quite heavy, so they're well made. The other thing that I was playing Ruby, with, Ruby, who was the supplier for those? William Woodwright. If you go to penblanks.ca. That's where you can get them. And I like the fact that they have the black and the, the white, so you can tell which one's salt and which one's pepper. Yeah, thanks. And then I also kind of went to the birds and played around with turning some birds. Mm -hmm. This one I turned on three axes. This one I turned on one axis. And um, the three axes, I was able to shape the bottom. And the one axis, I ended up cutting this part out with the bandsaw. And then I just mounted it on a piece of scrap madrone that I had lying around that had so many holes in it. Unless I resined it, it wasn't going to be turnable. But it makes like a nice sort of decorative piece uh just sitting on a 
on a table. Okay. Right, thanks. That's it. All right, the only thing unusual I've done in the last month is to turn steel for the first time or iron. Um, I've always wanted to have a little table that I can uh, put into the banjo on my lathe to support a router maybe alongside it or to use it as a marking uh, gauge. So um, this month I went to Home Depot. I bought a floor flange and a piece of uh, three quarter inch pipe. Um, and thought it ought to you know, be close enough, but it turns out the three quarter inch pipe is actually a 16th inch too large to fit into my um, banjo opening. So since I've got a friend with a metal working shop that normally uh, makes things for me, but he's in Arizona. So I tried, I just put the piece of pipe on my lathe, used a high speed steel um, cutter, basically a John Jordan hollowing, um, tool and it worked fairly well riding the bevel on that i was able to take ribbons of steel off um, hit it with a file and then some sandpaper and got a really nice consistent finish and now i have a table for my lathe there was a question how much did you have to take off about a 16th of an inch who else you got online there i think that's it doug so we're back to you oh yeah Yeah. I we're, I'm going to go over that in the demonstration. Yeah, I'll go over that. So let's take a quick break um, and uh, take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and start working on our, our photography demonstration. Thank you.